Well, if you'll turn in your Bible, it's a hard book to find, perhaps, but if you have your Bible marked with where we've been studying the Minor Prophets, you're going to go to the book of Habakkuk. Book of Habakkuk. Now, we haven't covered Obadiah yet, and we're going to get to that, so we're not, we're not going in perfect order as far as in the Bible. But the books of the Bible, Minor Prophets, are not in chronological order. They're not in exactly dated. And so we have not got to Obadiah. We'll get to Obadiah perhaps next Wednesday. It'll come up here. But we're going to be in Habakkuk tonight. And so that is sometimes tricky to find. If you're not in the Minor Prophets, your Bible, those pages may look almost brand new. They may be sticking together. If you're not in that part often, they may not open easily. So you're going to go find Daniel... Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. All right, it's not a small book like many of these are, and so it's easy to miss. If you have a Thompson chain, it's easy, 989, all right, 989. Most of you don't probably, so whatever your Bible has, you may have to do a little digging to find the book of Habakkuk. All right, I think you might have seen that in... The bulletin, but uh, my, my daughters and I will be leaving tomorrow evening and driving. That's sort of funny. My mom, my sisters, my aunt, maybe one other are coming up uh, from a more south central PA for a, a work day or two around the house. And so we'll see them a little bit. And then my mom's spending the night, but Jenna and Emily and I, we're going down Thursday night to her house, which she won't be there, all right, just to knock off a little bit of the trip. It makes for a little, just a, an hour and a half takes off a little bit of that long trip, and, uh, and especially because Saturday we're driving back after the wedding straight through, get home hopefully by two in the morning. So uh, short down and back, we've got a good friend, John, who graduated with Jenna, went through all 13 years with Jenna, He's been in our youth group for six years, known him since he was a baby. And he's even been up here. Some of you may remember John, he came up here in November, right when we moved here, hung out for a week. And so he's getting married. Marrying, he just graduated from the Bill Rice Bible College, four years. His wife just graduated two days later from Ambassador. She's a missionary kid from Scotland. And uh, they are getting married and going into ministry. He's going to be the youth pastor and Christian school teacher at Tabernacle. Probably know Tabernacle, Virginia Beach, all right, area, the Rod Bell's old church. And uh, yeah, so they're excited. They're going there. And so we're excited for them, thrilled to death. And so we'll make a sh quick down and back. So you keep us in your prayers. Obviously, we'll not be here Friday. If you have any needs, please reach out to one of the deacons. Pastor Cremar, those are there. I know they can help you, okay? All right, we're in the book of Habakkuk. I'm going to do things a little different. I'm going to cover the book of Habakkuk, and then hopefully with five minutes left at 810, I'm going to finish tonight with a missionary letter too. All right, going to save those to the end here, all right? So we're in the book of Habakkuk. Six of the minor prophet books are down. We have six covered, all right? And I haven't covered any of them, all right? So I, I did most of the major prophets, but two weeks on most of the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then shifted down as Charlie was headed out. And I appreciate, again, the men that have covered six of the books. So we have six left. After tonight, there'll be five left. All right, so we're in the little book of Habakkuk, one of those books uh, often misspelled there when you teach in school and you're doing your books of the Bible and authors and spelling. That can be a tricky one there, H-A-B-A-K-K-U-K. -K -K All right, as you can see, if you look, it's probably maybe one page, perhaps two in your Bible, and uh, you could read it probably, and depending on your reading speed, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, uh, less than some chapters in the Bible. All right, so not sure who's all been here. If you've been coming to all the Minor Prophet books, you have an idea of what's going on in the Minor Prophets. Again, they're called Minor. Why? Not because they're less important and they're not that. No, no, no. It's because the scope of their prophecies, the scope of their vision, if you would, and is, is typically smaller than the major, the larger scope, all right? Not only are the major prophet books largely bigger, all right, with the exception of Daniel, that uh, these are usually very short books. They're not, they're not Im unimportant. They're not, eh, no big deal. Uh, they're just the scope of their prophecy is a little smaller, not as broad as Isaiah's, not as broad as Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and even Daniel. And so these are tremendous books, great truths, often not read, Hard sometimes to understand, but if you look at as a whole, if you've been listening to the men that have preached and sort of introduced the book and what the theme is, you, you should be seeing current themes. A lot of it, of course, is God's judgment, uh, God using other nations, 
uh, whether it's Assyria or Babylon, and uh, qu sometimes questioning God. We see God's love not just for, He only loves the Jews. Whoa, 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 whoa. He sends a prof two prophets you've had already to Nineveh, Jonah and Nahum, all right? Repent. They repented. He forgave them. He loves them. Uh, Obadiah, we'll see, prophet to the Edomites, uh, descendants of Esau. What? I thought God, uh, Amos, some of, uh, some of these kind of, you know, some of these things here. Uh, prophecies for various people groups as well as Israel. So God loves all people groups. God is merciful to all, not just the Jews. And any who would turn and repent and come to him, uh, God is always responded throughout the Bible. But here we go to the little book. So let's, let's read just a few verses. We'll uh, have a quick word of prayer. We'll give you the basic beginning, and we'll see if you can help you understand the book. Let's read the first four verses. So the best way to understand the book of Habakkuk, it's sort of like the book of Job a little bit. If you don't know, it's a little bit of dialogue. So he's going to start with Habakkuk talking to God Jehovah. Then you're going to have God answer him. Then you're going to have Habakkuk come back with his rebuttal or answer. Then you're gonna, okay, it's going to go a little bit back and forth is how God has uh, given us this book. So we start with Habakkuk's main struggle he's struggling with. This is what's bothering him. This is what's causing him to be... Uh, I understand what God's doing. We, we all have those. Maybe you're here tonight and you have one of those. What? So Habakkuk is going to present what is causing him anguish. Verse 1, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Boy, some of you could, that's words right off of your heart. Lord, I'm crying out to you. It doesn't sound like you're, I don't think you're listening. I don't, where are you? Habakkuk, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, thou wilt not save. Verse 3. Why? We, we've looked at that before. Maybe you remember that when we, a year or two years ago when we were looking through the Psalms. Those two questions often asked by all people. How long, God? What are you doing? Come on. And why? Why? So we already have those. How long? And now verse 3. Why? Dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and, and violence are before me, and there are, that, or there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law, this is what he thinks, this is what he's thinking, this is what makes sense to him. Therefore, my conclusion is the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. Habakkuk, how can you say that? Here's why. Because in my eyes, for the wicked doth compass about the right, righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. You know what? I mean, that, that's written just like today. The, the Christian. What are you doing, God? Maybe the broad scope of, look at our country, look at our nation. I, I see such wickedness, just like he sees in his nation. I thought you hate sin. I thought you deal with sin. I thought you're holy. I thought you're righteous. Well, why aren't you doing anything? It grieves me. It grieves me. My people, my nation, my country, it grieves me. All around I see is sin and wickedness. You know, that, you could say, that's my country. I'm so, oh, what's wrong, God? And the, look at the leaders and look what's going on. And it doesn't seem like God's doing much. And it doesn't make sense, God. How come you're not hearing my cry? I've been asking you to, oh, God, do something. Oh, you know, why, Lord? How, how come it seems like it gets worse? My conclusion, therefore, is verse 4, that I guess the law is slacked. I guess judgment's not going to happen. I guess you're not going to do anything. Because all I see is the wicked sort of sucking up and overcoming like a wave. All the righteous. Looks like they're winning. And all I perceive is wrong justice and wrong judgment. <laughs> and that's his cry. To Jehovah God. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, as we get into the book of Habakkuk, Lord, though it's often a minor prophet, maybe overlooked, not read, read quickly. Lord, every word of Scripture is yours, inspired, God breathed, profitable, important. And Lord, may we see 
the great truths in this little book. Habakkuk, just like us, Lord. Oh, we may not always cry it out loud, but we may think it. Oh, God, what are you doing? We may see it as we look at the world. We may look at our country. We may just look at our own life or family just around us. Say, it doesn't make a lot of sense, God. I'm asking you this, and it doesn't seem to be happening. And uh, it just seems like bad things are happening to good people, and, and good things are happening to bad people. I don't understand what's going on. And Lord, we see a man, Habakkuk, being honest, crying out to you. Lord, I pray that we would come to the same conclusion that you brought him to as he humbled himself and drew near to you. And Lord, we pray, we thank you that you're such a gracious, patient God. And Lord, I pray that we would come to you with our questions, come in the right spirit. Lord, we know that your word has the answer. I pray now as we look at this, Lord, for a few minutes, would you open our hearts and open our eyes that we learn to trust you even more in Jesus' name. Amen. See, so the first four verses, Habakkuk, the prophet. Let, let me give you a little bit about the setting, just so you understand. Again, all we're doing tonight is giving you a quick overview. We're not going to be able to stop long. It's a 30-minute rest stop as you get to your destination, all right? You'll have to come back on your own sometime and make a visit, all right? But it's a great little book. You can study on your own. Don't be afraid of it. Maybe you have. Maybe it's your favorite little book. Time period is roughly 625 to 600 B.C., and all of you say, amen, and most of you are like, I don't know what that means, all right, <laughs> that's okay, all right, you may, you may be keeping notes, but maybe not. So uh, we're talking about the, roughly the same time period as the prophet Jeremiah. So Habakkuk is believed to be, and, and, and believed to be a contemporary of the same time period as Jeremiah. We can't prove it, nobody knows any of the dates, but to, based on the book, and we'll show you a few things, it looks clear that it's the beginning of the Babylonian or called Chaldean Empire of Nebuchadnezzar, and we can date that very accurately with uh, the Bible and secular history right around 610, 605 B.C. So somewhere in this general, is, he's writing this, and he has, we don't know his age, we have Hardly any background of him. We don't know what he looked like. We don't know how old he was. We don't know if he was married. We just know that God called him a prophet. He may have been a priest and a prophet. He may not have been. He may have been a musician. We'll show you that. We don't know anything about him, really. Uh, God doesn't reveal much about that to us. But he, he's likely living at the time period. He probably likely saw the great reign, or at least the end of it, depending on his age, of King Josiah. Wow. That great final godly righteous king who God withheld judgment because of his humility and love for God. He probably lived at that time period and saw that. And then when Josiah died, he saw what happened to the nation and his sons and the wickedness. And so this is what he's seeing now. After the great revival of Josiah and great moments in their history, a, a good almost 30 year period or so, now it's just, whoa, and king after king here at the end has been vile and wicked. I mean, wickedness is just getting worse and evil and immorality. It's just awful. And, and he, he, Jeremiah was the main prophet maybe, but now he's living at the same time and he's looking around saying, God, this grieves my heart. I've been pleading for you to, to do something among my nation and my people. I know that you hate sin, God. How can this sin abound? Why does it just seem like you're not doing anything? Oh, it grieves me. I, it just doesn't seem like you're there. Or you're silent. Or what's going on? And, and we see that here. And we don't know much again. Some have called him the doubting Thomas of the Old Testament. At least at the beginning. Who knows? I like what one preacher said. The book has three chapters and there's really a simple three outline. Verse one is his burden. Chapter 2 there, or actually, yeah, chapter 2, you'll see his vision, and chapter 3, you'll see his prayer. So a burden, a vision, and a prayer. Three little chapters, each one a little different. His burden, here's what he's burdened for. Let me ask you, what are you burdened for? Now, maybe you carry burdens that are your own making. You're keeping all those cares and worries, as we heard Morris Geiser preach on casting all your care, and you're just so bogged down with anxieties that it's your burden. But maybe you just have a burden. You're burdened over this church. You're burdened over your children. You're burdened over your town. You're burdened over America. You're burdened over the government. You're burdened over, what, what, you're just burdened. And maybe you, you have a regular daily cry to God, oh God. But it doesn't really seem like not much happening. And maybe you say, well, I guess I'm just one person. Or 
You know, maybe you, you get the Elijah syndrome. I guess I'm the only one. Well, Habakkuk's struggling, isn't he? He's being honest with God. God likes honesty, and he wants us to be honest. And now verses 5 through 11. If you don't know this, you might want to jot this down. It'll help you when you read it in the future. Because it it's not going to tell you necessarily this is God speaking. But verses 5 to 11 is God answering. Okay, so you have to understand that. It may not make a lot of sense to you if you don't understand that. So now we have God responding, sort of like the member book of Job a little bit. God's responding now to Habakkuk's cry and questioning. Verse 5. Behold ye among the heathen. Now he's basically saying, Habakkuk, look, gaze, behold and see. What? What does he want him to see? Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told you. Now, you may recognize that verse. Habakkuk is quoted several times in the New Testament. You may remember that. Paul quoted that. We were going through that in our adult Bible class, Sunday school, not too long ago. He quoted that as he was preaching. All right? And so God is saying, look, oh, now God's not angry. God is answering him, and you've got to remember, what, what, what is Habakkuk looking at? Now remember, let's not be too tough. No indwelling Holy Spirit. No complete scriptures like we have. No, you know, what we would call the church pilling ground of the truth. Jewish nation is just well, about to be full apostasy and judged. The, the northern kingdom has already long ago been judged and carried into captivity by the Assyrians. But the Assyrians, who were a great wicked nation, we think of Nineveh, has basically been destroyed. Now, God had already used Assyria, but he was done with them. And so now there's this new nation coming, and it's upstart. It's the Chaldeans. It's called the Chaldeans in here, another name that we would call the Babylonians. And now we know that's Nebuchadnezzar and the Chaldeans. And they come, and they wipe out. And now now they're, they're, they're the new world power now. Or they're about to be. They're, ba they're probably not quite yet. But they're about to be. Or they're just starting. The Egyptians are, are no longer that powerful anymore as a nation. And so God is raising up a new nation, a wicked nation, that's going to be his instrument. We've looked at this before. And Ezekiel and some of the other books. It's going to cause anguish to God. That doesn't make sense, God. We're going to get to that. And God says, well, behold and look and see. Look among the wicked heathen nations. Do you not know what I've done in the past? Do you not know what I'm going to do? I am going to do a work. Again, we're not looking at every single verse. We don't have time to do that. But verse 6, For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans. I. I'm in charge of that. I set up kings and kingdoms. I tear down kings and kingdoms. They're in my hand. I am raising up the Chaldean or Babylonians for my purposes. Hmm. To do... do Come on, God, you're not. No, no, I am working. I'm working. I'm going to do a work. I'm raising them up. And they're a bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. And God gives a description of what we already know. Now, as we look back, the Babylonian Empire, wicked. They're terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity. And he describes their horses and their military, verse 8. And they're going to come for violence. And he describes all of them. And he finishes up in verse 11. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this, his power, unto his God. And again, I'm not trying to go, we don't have time to go into every verse and give every explanation and every word-for-word -word expository on a short service tonight. But God's response is dealing with Habakkuk. Not, he's not angry. Behold and look and gaze. You already forget what I have done, what I am doing. I am completely sovereign and in charge. I do deal with sin always, for I am holy. I may not deal with it the way you think it should be done or the way you want it to be done, but I always deal with sin, and I am using this nation. And Habakkuk saying, God, you need to do something. Why aren't you doing anything? I thought you're holy. Deal with sin. Are you unattached? Do you not care? Sometimes we do that. We accuse God, right? And we. Get a little upset with God. I want you to deal with it right now. It doesn't make sense. I mean, why did that person die? Well, why is that ruler still in judgment? How come that missionary died? How come people are serving the Lord got cancer? Well, why does it seem like the, the rock man in Hollywood? Come on, God. Everything seems reversed. 
You know, now sometimes we can get this sad story of, you know, we, we like to pretend we're righteous <laughs> and we're good. You know, how come, you know, I don't know about that one. And that's not fair. They got lots of money and we're struggling. Or how come they have, all, you know, we, we are very limited. We have no idea what's going on. But sometimes we'll, we'll accuse God and God answers back to back. Now, Habakkuk responds. This is his second response. Verses 12 to 17. I must hurry. Now, this shocked him even more. <laughs> You mean to tell me you're going to use a wicked, a more wicked nation than us? To how could you use the Chaldeans? Well, that doesn't even that makes even I can't believe you would do that. Are you? He's blown away from that. Look what he says in verse twelve. What art thou not for? And by the way, this is a tremendous verse on character of God. Verses twelve and thirteen. Some of you may be reading it for the first time. That's great. Mark it down. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine holy one? I know who you are. Boy, just that little question there. You could preach on that. You can teach on that. You're from everlasting, no beginning, no ending, all encompassing. Wow, you're the Lord my God. You are holy. We shall not die, O Lord, that thou hast ordained them for judgment, and Almighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Here's what he blows them away. That thou art of pure eyes than to behold evil. Canst not look on iniquity. There's a verse to teach children, everybody. God cannot look at sin. God will not look at sin. God is absolutely holy. No sin will ever enter heaven. God, how could you use the Babylonian Chaldeans? They're evil and wicked. You're holy. You can't even look at sin. So if you look, can't even look at sin, how could you use such a sinful nation? That doesn't make any sense. Habakkuk is limited. He's a person. And that's what we do. We, we just look at our little view and we, God, that's, that, that seems even more unfair than anything. I mean, I know our nation of Judah is wicked and I'm grieved over it, but we're your people at least. Not all of us are wicked. How can you use an even more wicked nation that doesn't even have anything to do with you to judge a God? I, doesn't, I can't understand that one. And, and he finishes verses 14, 15, and 16. I'll just read the last verse 17. Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? I mean, God, we're talking about nations. Now look, Judah is wicked and, and we've gone into sin and we deserve it and I'm grieved over it. But humanly, humanly, if we were to compare what they do and how they treat people and murder and violence and rape, I mean, just whoa. The Assyrians were wicked. I mean, the Babylonians, I can't understand how you could use them. That's not, and maybe we, we question those kind of things. Come on, God, get rid of this leader. Get rid of this person. Come on, God, boom, do this. Well, you, you can do it. Why don't you? You're, there's nothing you can't do. Come on, God. And I, I can't believe it. Now, look, we look at the book, and we shouldn't just be looking at America. We can apply it to that, but the, we need to be looking at ourselves, not just like, well, okay, good, I'm pretty good, and, and we're just, no, well, yes, there's application there for our burden, maybe over our country or nation, or, but we should be looking at ourselves as well here, and when God deals with sin, and not, maybe not pretend that I'm so holy, or you're so holy, or we're so righteous, and everybody else isn't, and God needs to deal with them, and, you know, those kind of things where we sort of set ourselves up for superior to others. Well, God is gracious. I'm not very holy or faithful. It's not up to me to tell God what to do. And so now you get to chapter number two. Habakkuk is really stymied here. God gave him an answer and it didn't make sense. And so what's he going to do? Is he going to run? Is he going to quit? Is he going to give up? Is he going to quit? Is he going to go into apostasy? Chapter two, verse one, he makes his decision. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. I'm, I'm still questioning, but hmm. I'm going to wait. I'm, gonna try, I'm, gonna, I'm not bailing on God. S similar to Asaph in Psalm 73, right? Until I went into the... Until, until I sort of, under, I spent time with God, or I went into the holy place, or I went, oh, now I begin to see, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit back, and I'm going to go to a private place and a quiet place, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait for God. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to question. I'm just going to wait, and I'm going to see, and I'm going to keep my mouth closed. 
I'm going to listen to see what God has to say. I'm going to listen. Now, God answers. God answers. And, and the, rest of, the rest of the chapter really here is God answering. We're not going to spend a lot of time in chapter 2. I'd encourage you to read that on your own. Chapter 1 is, is the burden. Chapter 2, verse 2, and the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. Chapter 1, you have Habakkuk's burden. Chapter 2, you have Habakkuk's vision. What do you mean a vision? God's saying, this is, I'm prophesying. Here's what's going to happen. Write it down. I'm telling you what will happen. Here is your vision, not, not a mysterious, magical thing. This is what it is. Make it plain upon tables or tablets. That, okay, you can write it down. This is exactly, I'm going to reveal this to you. And so basically the rest of the chapter here is going to tell you what God says. Wait a minute. I'll tell you what I'll do with the Chaldeans. I'll, I'll deal with the Chaldeans and Babylonians. In my time, when I'm finished with them, and I will deal with them severely, but that's not for you to worry about. And we come to the key verse in the whole book, and that's chapter 2, verse 4. It's a verse you know probably, certainly the ending. Here's the key verse in the whole book. Behold, this soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. There's that first mention in the Bible, the just shall live by faith, or the just shall live by his faith. You know that verse, it's mentioned three times in the New Testament. It's in Romans, it's in Galatians, it's in Hebrews. The just shall live by faith. It's that verse that sparked the Reformation of Martin Luther. The just shall live by faith, not works, by faith. By faith. And here's the message, Habakkuk. Do you trust me? And that's the question for everybody in the room. Do you really trust God? Is he really good? Is he unfair? Does he miss things? Is he sleeping? So I know he's, I know that. No, I know that's not true. But sometimes it just seems. It seems. What are we leaning on? I get that way, absolutely. A lot of times when that Bible gets closed, oh yeah, we're going to real question quickly. Anytime we begin to lose that fellowship with the Lord and drift, oh boy. We'll start questioning the whys and the how longs and the getting upset. We'll look at everything and start blaming God. Habakkuk, the just, shall live by faith. You need to trust me. You need to have faith in me. You need not look at every little thing. You need to know that I am what you said. I am Jehovah God. I am almighty. I am everlasting. I am holy and righteous. Not one sin will ever escape my eyes. Not one time. Everything will be done right and righteously. The just shall live by faith. And really, the remainder of chapter 2, God lays it right out there. It's, it's sometimes called the chapter of woe. Woe is me. There's five or six woes, W-O-E. You see the first one in verse 6 in the middle. Woe to him that increaseth that which is not his. Verse 9, woe to him that coveteth. Now, these are verses dealing hermeneutically with the Chaldeans, but God wants us to apply these to us. God says, I hate these things, and I will deal with those. Covetousness. He's dealing with the sins of Babylon, what he's going to do with them. The woes, verse 12, woe to him that buildeth a town with blood, and establisheth the city by iniquity. I will deal with that. Verse 14, you may have heard this verse before. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Wow, when's that going to take place? The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Look at verse 15. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, alcoholic beverage, and putteth a bottle to him, and maketh him drunken. Verse 16. Thou art filled with shame. Verse 19, the last woe. Woe unto him that saith to the... He's talking about idolatry. That saith to the wood, a wooden idol, awake to the dumb stone, arise. Verse 20, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. God says, I am fully aware of what's going on. I hate these things. Woe, woe, I will judge both nations and individuals who do these things. I'm not sleeping. I'm aware. I have a plan. The just shall live by faith. 
I'm not sleeping. I'm not slumbering. I'm just as sovereign on the throne as I've always been. I have my purpose as Habakkuk, and you need to trust me and keep your eyes on me. And we come to that great final chapter, verse chapter 3. It's no longer a burden or a vision. Notice it's a prayer. A prayer or a song. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, upon Shigalneth. That word here you may recognize in the Psalms. Specific song designed to be taught. Some say that he was a musician, maybe a poet. You say, why is that? Well, you'll notice verse 3 in the middle, the word Selah. Verse 9 toward the end, Selah. Verse 13 at the end, Selah. And the very final sentence of the whole book, to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. We, no one knows exactly what Selah means. The, the pause, the meditate, a uh, musical note of a stanza. But it's obvious that when we come to this final chapter, just like Job at the end of the book of Job, where Job says, I abhor myself and repent. <laughs> Forgive me for questioning you, God. Whoa, you are almighty. All right? Habakkuk here it takes a little step back. It says, here's my prayer. Here's my song. Here's my, what I'm, and it's designed to be sung and to be taught. Here's what I've learned about God. Again, our time, we're not going to be able to break the entire thing down. All right, but notice how he starts at verse 2. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, here's that phrase, maybe you've heard it. Revive, revival, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. Oh God, send revival. You know what he's saying here? Not just in Judah, but oh God, in my heart. God, revive me. You're right. God, I was questioning. I was, oh, look what I was turning into, God. Oh, God, I've heard you. I humble myself. Forgive me. I was questioning you, Almighty One. I had a wrong spirit. I didn't understand. And I may not completely even understand, God. But I want to live by faith. Revive thy work in the midst of the years. And then he begins a song, and you'll have to read that on your own. It's a great prayer. It's a great song may not make all perfect sense to you. It's characteristics of God, different things there. It'll take you some meditation and tune on it. You may have to pull out a, a, you know, a concordance, but that's okay. A little, little hard work there. You'll understand the, the thing, I think. So let's just bring it to the conclusion. Let's come to some of the greatest verses in all the Bible. Certainly in the Old Testament. It's definitely in the Minor Prophets. The last three verses of Habakkuk. Believe it or not, as a mean Bible teacher, I have had many a senior high Bible class memorize those three verses. For those who maybe say, oh, the verses are too long, the verse of the month. That's okay. Sometimes they're short. And uh, you know what? I, I, I know when the, kid, the kids grumble, as soon as they look at one, they don't even look at it. But I can't tell you how many young people, and it's not because of me, when we go through a certain book, we go through all 66 books of the Bible. It's a general overview, Route 66. So a lot of times we memorize verses you'll never memorize, verses of the Minor Prophets. And this was the one we always memorized, 9 through 12. And I can't tell you, many young people afterwards would say, this, these are some of my favorite verses. I can remember a couple graduates had it in the yearbook. Like, nothing because of me. They're in the Bible. But here's his conclusion. All right, Lord. Habakkuk, we say, Habakkuk, before you leave, what did you learn? What did you learn about God? Did you learn anything through any of this? Is your faith strengthened? Here's his answer. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. I remember one time we made the kids, not that we were trying to translate the Bible, but just for fun. We said, well, write that and put it in today's terms. <laughs> Although the fridge broke down, the car needs repaired. <laughs> Although I just got laid off from my job. Although I got nothing in savings, although I got a doctor's appointment, everything's going bad right now. I look around and it looks like everything's failing and there's no, oh my goodness, am I going to bail on God? Habakkuk says in verse 18, that great statement of faith, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength 
And he will make my feet like hinds, like deer's feet. And he will make me to walk upon mine high places. To the chief singer on my stringed instruments. Like one preacher said, the book started, I mean, notice the difference in the beginning and the end. Started with troubled and a brooding man questioning God, and it ended, make many of the Psalms, with a satisfied, trusting man. It does not mean every question was answered. It doesn't mean every question he had, God gave him exactly what he wanted to hear. Because God's not obligated to do that. And not one of, how could we even understand God? I mean, <laughs> and I question God. How could we, as finite, sinful, created beings, <laughs> Ask God to explain things that we have no idea about, just like in the book of Job, right? Let's go through these hundreds of questions. Were you there when I created you? Know how this works? Boom, 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 boom. Sorry. Sorry, Lord. <laughs> You're right. I don't <laughs> Habakkuk said, Lord, I may not understand, but I'm going to trust you. That doesn't mean he never had a moment after this where he didn't struggle, but he said, God, here, my vision is limited. Things don't look the way I would do it, but you're my God. I'm going to trust you. You're almighty. I'm going to place. Notice, it's a, it's a decision of the will. I will. I've made the decision. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to trust my senses, my emotions, or my feelings. I'm not going to just constantly be looking around, because as soon as I do, I'm going to start questioning and get upset. I'm going to live by faith in a God of faith and a trusting God. I will rejoice in the Lord. Notice, not just I'm not going to trust with pouting. I'm going to rejoice. God, you're in control. It doesn't mean I stop, I don't pray. It doesn't mean I'm not still burdened. It doesn't mean I don't cry out for revival. It doesn't mean I don't anticipate God working. It doesn't mean I give up, but I'm going to rejoice. I'm not walking around just like, okay, I trust in the Lord. <laughs> I'm rejoicing in God. He's helped me. And if I, if I get questioning again, I've got to go right back to God. For us, we go right back to the book, right back to God and say, God, I trust you. The just shall live by faith. Well, we'll get to those missionary letters next week. We'll share those another time. Let me ask you to stand. We're going to close in prayer. If you're here tonight, just like I get and just like every believer gets, we can all get those times. It seems like everything's going wrong. Well, now you've got to ask a question. Are you bringing it upon yourself? Is it sin? The way, I mean, is God dealing with this? Is he chasing you? It could be the Lord. Get to, examine yourself. But it could simply be that, God, I'm just going to trust you. Doesn't mean I don't pray for a con my country, my family, my people. I look within, revive me, start with me, oh God. But I want to live by faith. I want to trust you. I want to be in the Bible. I want to rejoice. I want to be used of you. Just take it to the Lord. I get that way often. You probably do as well. God understands that. He knows we're dust, we're created. He understands our frame. But he also wants us to learn to trust him. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, the whole Bible is full of tremendous truths. Some are easier to see. They're on the surface. Many are below the surface. And in Proverbs, you say we've got to dig for those like hid treasure. We've got to seek them. We've got to work at it. And when we do that, you'll reveal yourself to us and we'll find true wisdom and true understanding. Lord, let us not be content with just surface mining. Quick little devotions, one little thing here, uh, maybe even not even reading the Bible, just reading an email devotion or a quick little book and then wondering why our faith is weak, why we don't have great faith, why we struggle, why we don't have joy. Lord, we've got to get in the Word of God. We've got to read. We've got to see you in history. We've got to see you in every area. We've got to gaze and realize, God, everything is in your plan and under control. You are faithful. You always are. Everything will be made right. May we do what we need to do with joy. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Habakkuk. Thank you for each one here, our teachers, our workers, our students, our children, our teens. Bring us back safely, I pray, on Sunday to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lord bless you. Have a great night. Thanks for being here.